All right. Well, it's 12.02. So you have arrived at AARP and ABIPA's Black History Month event, Actively Aging Through Activism and Art, featuring Ann Miller Woodford, who will be coming in on the red carpet shortly. One definition of the word treasure is a person esteemed rare or precious. Upon my first conversation with Ann Miller Woodford, I became aware that I had come to meet a treasure in our community. In a few moments, we will have the shared experience of connecting with the treasure of Ann Miller Woodford. We want to know a little bit about you today, so please do write in the chat box to all where you're coming from and why you joined us today. My name is Rebecca Chaplin, and I serve as the Associate State Director with AARP North Carolina in the Mountain Region. Today's event is inspired by, the Black, by Black History Month and is the beginning of a quarterly lecture and book club series on fostering racial justice. This event was inspired by AARP North Carolina volunteers and my friend and colleague to my left, Joanna greer McGeechan with ABIPA. AARP is in this space of, of working to have a conversation about our history and about racial justice as a continuation of decades of work in federal and state legislative advocacy, legal advocacy programs and um, services and more. In fact, our founder, Dr. Ethel Percy Andrus, was a champion for racial justice in school systems in Illinois and California before she moved into the field of advocacy for those who are aging. A quote by Dr. Andrus, which I think describes my colleague, Joanna, our speaker today, and many of you is, we learn the inner secret of happiness when we learn to direct our inner drives, our interests, and our attention to something besides ourselves. Joanna, tell us more about why you and ABIPA partnered with AARP on this event. Um, well, we're just excited again to continue our strong partnership with AARP um, because, and the reason we're in this space today, specifically around African American History Month um, and art and activism and really how do we engage in a way that is meaningful um, to us personally but then also as a community because a lot of times we think about Black History Month as um, the shortest month of the year so that's <laughs> the only time we have to focus but this is also um, the mindset that it's 365 years that we're uh, days a year that we really learn about each other yeah and these are those instances that we can also know that um, as we age, because we all are actively aging, sometimes that's when people become the most active. And so we really want to encourage the listeners, those that are participating today, of how they can use their powers for good also as activists. Um, and I believe that we're going to really have that demonstration from Anne. And we have a wonderful connection with Anne from the work that I'm doing in collaboration with Dr. Amina Batata and Dr. Jill Frumwick um, for the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation and the Interdisciplinary Research Leaders Project. That's a long name, <laughs> IRL. But we're really doing research around the impact of racism on um, our neighbors here in Western North Carolina. And because of that, um, Anne is one of our community advisory board members, as well as one of our mentors. So I am very privileged to be a part of showcasing the talent that I am inspired by um, every day in interaction with her. Um, we're doing some amazing work and you're going to hear more of that um, during the session. So we were just really excited to be here. All right, thank you. We are rolling out the red carpet as we speak and soon before you will appear our uh, our speaker today, Ann Miller Woodford. And I'm gonna go ahead and spotlight you and uh, turn on your presentation and take it away. And you are muted, so just try to unmute yourself. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Can you hear me all right now? Yes. Okay, great. Well, I thank you. I thank Joanna for being so inspiring to me, helping me and introducing me to you, Rebecca. So thank you and thank all the folks that have joined us today. It's really an exciting time for us because I've noticed that all around us right now, we have a lot of people looking at the history of our people. And I am so happy to be one who has 
written a book about the history of the people here in far western North Carolina. And I just appreciate you, appreciate the folks with AARP. I appreciate you for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk with people because we look at, uh, sometimes people look at our people in far western North Carolina as being invisible. So I do a lot of work on making the invisible visible. Uh, I will move on. Uh, I am an, I'm very active. I have been active most of my life, but I was very shy as a child and all, all the way up in, in, until I became a, an adult. But we all have to move out. I have a friend who called me one day and she said, oh, I'm just so bored. She's probably about my age. And I said, bored? <laughs> can you be bored? There's so much to do. <laughs> we can move to the next slide. <laughs> there is so much to, to act on. I wrote the book, When All God's Children Get Together, working in cooperation with One Dozen Who Care. We did a project in 1998 when we originally opened our uh, organization for black women who could step out and we knew that we could do the work, but we weren't as much welcome in the, in the community around us as much as we would have liked because we could do the work, but there was no opportunity. So in 1998, we had an event called When All God's Children Get Together and it pulled, pulled us all together with preachers and singers and all kinds of folks that were just, uh, um, wanting to work together. So uh, later, I started to look around and I saw that older people were passing away and taking their stories with them. I am, I was very concerned about that when my mom and dad were there and they had stories to tell and all around folks were telling stories. And when I was a little kid, we sat around the the old uh, pot-bellied stove and in the winter time and listen to the old folks telling stories. And I really wish we could get the kids to do that today. So it'll be my job to work toward that. Uh, so when all God's children get together, took five years of research and writing for me. I traveled all over Western North Carolina and the Blue Ridge National Heritage Area supported us in the beginning, but after a while, we, I had to go out on my own because there was just so much to find out, but so few people to give us the information or they were shy about it. Barbara McRae uh, is a wonderful person who was uh, the, the, um, the editor of the Franklin Press. And she joined me and designed my book. And, and a, another friend actually helped me to line it up. And then you'll see in the next slide, I believe, uh, Dr. Patricia Beaver, Dr. John Insco, and David Brose, next slide, um, helped me to by putting their information into the front of the book so people can read it and they can they know that the information that I've placed uh, connects with the history of our region in general. Well, my life has just been so fascinating. And I have some pictures here of me, my mother with me, uh, with that fancy hairstyle that she had back in those days, holding me as a baby. And then uh, later with me as a little toddler, a little bit, little bitty baby still. I graduated from Allen High School in Asheville, North Carolina, because in this area, I'll talk about that a little bit more, the schools were segregated and there was nowhere to go after high school. Later, I became an airline stewardess and then I, I became an entrepreneur. And so um, I've lived all these different lifestyles. I'm an artist, an author, an entrepreneur, designer. And my work right now is to try to bring out the people who seem to be invisible, the African-American people in far Western North Carolina. I want those people to be visible to everybody across the nation and even some places in the world. One of my books is in, Oh, I'm in a oh, Cambodia. <laughs> next, next slide, please. Uh, my grandfather founded Happy Top. Happy Top is the Black community of Andrews. Um, he and his family lived in Cumming, Georgia. In 1912, there was a tragic racial cleansing that uh, chased all the white people of that community. Decided they wanted to be 
the whitest community or county in the United States. So because of an incident that you can read about in my book, as well as in several other books, uh, have a listing of different people who have written stories about this, the white people decided, the, the white caps decided to chase out all black people. So they burned the school, the church, burned some people's homes. My grandpa told about a, a family that the woman had just cooked supper. It was hot on the stove. And all of a sudden the white caps came, chased them out of their homes with nothing but the clothes on their backs and sat down to the table and ate their food. <laughs> they took their cows that were in the barn. They took their chickens in the coops took everything they had, chased them away, and dared them to ever come back. This was at gunpoint. So my grandpa worked for the railroad, and I believe it was the Southern Railroad. We've been investigating that to make sure it was the, the, the name of the railroad. He, he and his mother moved up to Marietta, Georgia, and then down to Blue Ridge, where he worked on the railroad, and he was required by the, the supervisors to travel with goods from coming from down in Blue Ridge up into Cherokee County. He said it was like night and day when he came up to Cherokee County, the people treated him like he was just another person. And he was thrilled with that. So one day he, he decided to get bold enough because at that time it was illegal by the law for a white person to sell land to a black person. And, but he said, I got up my nerve and I asked somebody, I asked a man, did he know if there was any land around here for sale? And he said, the man said, yeah, and took me right up to Andrews. And that's why he started, that's when he started uh, the Happy Top community built by building the first house there. Next, please. So grandpa um, came to Andrews, he built the house for his mother. And she came up to Andrews and as he traveled around to find out more about the Western North Carolina, he went out and met my grandma, Nora Alice Howell. And they married in 1919. And that was after he came back from World War I. And um, she had lived in that house uh, up until that point and, and uh, up till he returned from World War I and she found, had fallen in love with somebody. So she married, I mean, she decided she would marry this other man and move out. Grandpa brought grandma uh, into the house and they had eight children. And you, you'll be able to see uh, on the slide, uh, grandma's mother, Sally Powell Powell. And next, to, next on the horse is Deacon Christenberry Howell who was a farmer and a drover of horses and turkeys and pigs. Uh, grandpa used to, grandpa, daddy told me that grandpa used to tell them the stories of the turkeys following him down the Unicoi uh, Highway uh, and the turnpike, they called it Uni, Unicoi Turnpike. And the turkeys would fly up in the tree that night. He'd sleep, uh, camp out there next morning they would jump back down and follow him right down into Tennessee. <laughs> that was really something to hear about. Next, please. These are my mother's parents. My grandpa, Weimer Weichel, is on the left, and my granny, Irene, Amanda, Elizabeth, she had seven names. We never did get all those names together, <laughs> but it was something because grandpa married her. He was 21 when he married her and she was 15. Um, she, uh, they got married and she began to grow up. So she grew up to about five, five and weighed up at some time up to 450 pounds. Grandpa was four feet, 10 inches tall and weighed 130 pounds all of his adult life. <laughs> they lived in Franklin and that's where uh, my dad found um, my, my mother came over to Andrews to a church meeting and daddy met her there and he traveled back and forth to Franklin until he decided that they decided they would be married. Next, please. I stayed every uh, for two weeks every summer up until I went away to high school. I stayed with them and my sister also. And when I was a baby, my mother. So here are my sisters. And the, 
I am the oldest and then Mary Alice is the, the one in between and the baby is Nina. Nina Moses lives in Charlotte right now. That's my beautiful mother who was a fantastic singer and my dad up there playing his, what he called a French harp was a harmonica. And she passed away and, and, and left him. And this, this uh, photo down here shows him after she had passed away. And I love looking at his hands. That man's hands had done so much work. Next slide, please. Um, somewhere back there in the past, I looked at them and I loved them and they had so many wonderful stories that they would tell. And mom would say, oh, I can't remember. Daddy said, yes, you do. And he'd remind her and she'd start to tell a story as well. So I noticed that they really had stories that were great stories I wanted to hear. And I, I remembered grandpa telling stories in the wintertime, especially when they were inside around the stove with snow on the ground, they would tell these wonderful stories. So I knew, and one dozen who care, I brought it to one dozen who care. And they said, yes, let's do this. Let's record these stories. And that's how we got started doing this book when all God's children get together. Next, please. My sisters, my, my sister Mary Alice passed away in, in uh, 1991 and she was young. She was a poet. And the, the painting that I did of, of the two of us shows us in our little dresses with our little Mary Jane shoes. I connect my life stories with my artwork. Um, it's this one I call a simpler, sweeter time. And that was when Mary Alice, my little protector, when I was a little kid, I was older than she was by two years, but she protected me. If anybody bothered me at school, she'd say, I'll get you after school. And they knew she meant it. <laughs> so people did not bother me as much. Uh, on the right side is my sister, Nina. Nina Miller Moses lives in Charlotte now, but she's lived in, in California for, I, I don't, I'm not even sure how many years, uh, probably 30 years. She's a medical specialist. And she is a person who has honored me as an artist since she was a little girl of about four years old. She purchased my artworks when I would have given them to her. She and her husband had a business and they, and you can see her there with uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson and Danny Glover, the actor, um, and in her uniform because she stayed, she retired from the Army Air Force after 20 years. She's one that I love so dearly. Next slide, please. I have a vision to see young people like when I, I just told you about sitting around the stove, listening in the wintertime to the old people. I wanna see the young people listening to the stories of how I got over. That says how I go over, but how I got over is a song that we sang very often at church. And it was sort of went like, how I got over, how I got over, oh my Lord. And my soul looks back and wonders how I got over. Well, it just talks about how, what a struggle African-American people have had, but how we worked together and sometimes very much alone in pain and suffering sometimes, but we still made it. And my parents made it, even though my mother made a $4 a day working for one lady, about eight or $10 a day was about all she could make working in homes of the white people in the community. My dad did all kinds of work. Um, he was an amazing person with his work. Uh, he could do brick um, block, rock laying, concrete work, roofing, butchering hogs, he, he raised tobacco, and so it was very uh, hard, but daddy was never out of work. And so this song just tells us about that, uh, how people had to work to make it. That's what it means by how I got over. Next, please. We, um, there was a, a law that was the uh, people can look this up for themselves and read more about it. But the Plessy versus Ferguson Supreme Court decision 
back at the end of the 1800s in 1996, uh, 1896, uh, declared that schools would be separate but equal. And that was okay, we call them a white school and a black school. And that allowed the state to actually sponsor school segregation. Um, that was a terrible situation, but there was a Supreme Court decision in uh, 1954 that was called the Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, that overturned Plessy Ferguson. And that led to the ending of segregation for us all, all around. The Andrews Colored Negro School, it was Andrews Colored School for the four years that I, when I started, and then they named it um, Andrews Negro School, elementary school. Um, that building that you see was built about, was built in 1905 and it, and it closed down, but you can see the condition of it. Um, 1965 is when it closed and they integrated the schools. Well, when I was a little kid, people talked about Miss Elsie Osborne. She was a teacher in Andrews for 16 years. And then people just honored her teaching and the way she taught the, them how to have manners and taught them history of uh, our history, even though there was none of it in the history books. Miss Ida Mae Logan down on the uh, left side was my favorite teacher. She really cared about the students. And she was an older person who lived, who was from Asheville. These teachers and Andrews had to come all the way from Asheville or one came from South Carolina to live in Andrews to teach. That shows that how much they cared about education. Next, please. Oh, and that, that group right there that you see with her was the full student body, first to the eighth grade when we integrated the schools. Next, please. I started a business when, in 1972 in Columbus, Ohio, after I had been an airline stewardess. I graduated from Ohio University first after Allen High School in Asheville and went on to live in New York City as an air, airline stewardess after I graduated from Ohio University and um, married. And my husband said, no more flying for you. <laughs> so I came to Columbus, Ohio, and, and I started this business because I worked in a federated department store. African-American people constantly came uh, to me when I was working there to say, where are the Af Afrocentric or, or the uh, Black-oriented cards, uh, anything for us? And there was nothing. So I started one of the first three businesses in the United States that uh, developed African-American oriented greeting cards, stationery, playing cards, and dolls. I designed the doll, but I didn't actually create them until later. And I'll tell you about that. Please move to the next slide. I, I'm, I came home to live uh, with my folks and believed that I would be able to work and live in Andrews, but it didn't turn out to be the greatest thing for me because I could not find work in this area. Even with my education, I was not able to find the work. Um, my, I moved from, from Andrews to California to stay with my sister and her husband. They were in business, as I mentioned before, for themselves, and they took me once to a fundraiser and I met Miss Esther Rowe. My sister Nina introduced me to Miss Esther Rowe. And she said, I've always wanted to do something with dolls like that. I never would have told her about that or somebody about the, my dolls probably because I was still shy. But my sister told her and she asked me to join her. And she decided that she would back the creation of these dolls. We sold those dolls all over the world through the Army Air Force Exchange Service. And that was a, a really wonderful thing. We also sold it through the Ebony and Essence catalogs that they had at the time. So the dolls are all over. I have no idea where they all are, but they are spread out. Next one, please. <laughs> okay, I um, worked in sales when I was in California along with doing, um, the, doing my work as, in the sales. I always painted, no matter where I've lived, 
I've always done artwork. So you can see uh, some of these pieces here of artwork that I've done over the years. There's going to be a wonderful virtual exhibit with the Mountain Heritage Center at Western North Carolina, uh, uh, Western Carolina University with the Mountain Heritage Center Pam Meister's um, organization. And it will, it's called Ann Miller Woodford, the artist as storyteller. So there's a story behind each and every one of these paintings. I'll tell a real quick one right here that painting on the far left, my sister, myself, I was painting it and I didn't know what to put in the background when I had the lady painted. So I talked with a woman who had a home in South Africa and asked her if I could turn one of the skirts upside down and paint, put that behind it. She said, I'll take it and ask some of the African women that I work with. And she came back and she said, that's my painting. So don't sell that to anybody else. <laughs> so that's what happened to it. Next paint, next uh, slide, please. Uh, um, it's my God-given gift to be an artist. I tell my, the stories of my life, but I tell the stories of other people's lives as well, because I don't believe we should ever be invisible. People say sometimes, I don't see color. And that is not a compliment. You see color. It's a, it's a sort of just a, a stereotypical thing that people say because they care. They don't want to hurt my feelings or any the feelings of any African-American people. They think that saying I don't see color is a good thing. And I've actually heard African-American people say the same thing. Please look at me, see me, as you'll see um, a billboard later that we have. Look at me and talk to me, learn about me, not just me, I'm using me as an example. Talk to African-American people. Most of them are very willing to talk to you about the lives they've lived, and you don't have to feel guilty. When I was going with my dad to the elementary schools and we'd tell our stories about what was going on, I, the kids sometimes every now and then you'd find one that was sinking down in the chair with feeling guilty. One little girl said so. And I said, you're not guilty unless you make yourself guilty. You didn't do the things that happened to us. You have a future and you can change things. And I tell adults, you have white privilege. Some don't like to hear that, but I have privilege. All of us have some privilege. My privilege is education and the ability to write the book and to get out and speak to people as I'm speaking with you today. I can tell some more stories about these later on if you would like, uh, if you'd like to hear them, but we need to move on. Next slide, please. I looked around when I was in California and I saw homeless people. I saw people of all kinds of cultures and I saw sad children because I sold products to homes that took care of children for a lot of the time. So I, all of these have stories to go with them. We'll move on. Next slide. Uh, Anne's Tree, uh, African-American Art and Books is my website, is my business. And that's my website in the middle, www.annstree.com. It's important for people who want to learn more about the history to go there and see the panels that are up right now. The panels are being showed, shown at the Smith McDowell House Museum uh, in Asheville. You can go there and look at that exhibit and learn more about all the people that we have in this region. And you see some repetitions of pictures that I've shown you before. But on the right side, down at the bottom, you'll see um, a, a large, or it's Mount Olive Baptist Church in Waynesville. That church was uh, moved there from a white community that helped to support building it. And actually most of the churches were supported by white people in the communities who helped the black people to set up their own congregations. And one thing that I'll say is that church made it very possible for people who worked in dirty jobs all week, worked in people's homes for a little bit of nothing. The men and the women would dress up on Sundays and go and stand in front of the church and feel respected and speak well and preach well and sing beautifully. Next slide, please. 
this is the billboard that is in Murphy right now in Cherokee County. It is tells you to look at who I am. Look at who these people are. It's very important to understand people, not just African Americans. African Americans need to look at Native Americans and Latinx people. We all need to look at each other. This billboard was created to inspire conversations about racial issues in Western North Carolina. It's sponsored by the Asheville Buncombe Institute of Parity Achievement. That's called ABIPA for those who live in Asheville, they'll know. And the interdisciplinary research leaders that's funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. I'm very pleased that they chose. Joanna, thank you very much for you all for choosing to use a piece of my artwork to bring out these issues. Thank you so much. Next, please. One Dozen Who Care uh, is the probably the reason that I'm here right now, because I might have left the community and gone somewhere else. We have a, a talent and a brain drain in Western North Carolina, and it's a shame. But once I came back from California and looked around and saw all these wonderful African-American women trying to do work one on one, and I talked to them about it. And I said, please, we need to get together and do something. So I spoke with Brenda Blunt, who's down there beside me at the bottom, and Jean Bennett, who passed away, but she was she was a worked for the Cherokee County Health Department. And I asked those two what, what they thought about it. They they were very encouraging and said, let's, yes, let's let's put this group together. So they called together 22 African American women in our county. And we had looked around and we'd seen that out of all the boards, they had 32 boards in the county. I was the county planner. And by that time, I had been respected enough to be hired in this county. And my dear friend, Judy Brooks, is the one who talked to me about being the Chamber of Commerce director first. And they hired me in Andrews. I was the Andrews Chamber director. And then I went to the Cherokee County planning position and um, Ju Judy recommended that also. I will always honor her for having spoken with me and encouraged me to go and apply for the job. Uh, the Cherokee County had 32 boards and on those boards, there was one African-American person. And that was Jean Bennett who became the first president of One Dozen Who Care. She looked like a white woman. So we decided that we needed to train ourselves. We did it. So we had a, a longer mission statement at that time, but the mission right now of ODWC is ODWC empowers, educates, and encourages economic development for women, youth, and elders in far Western North Carolina in order to bridge cultures and create community bonds. We have a vision to bring together the community and through that bringing together, we want to honor and respect racial and cultural diversity. So if you'll look uh, at the upper right corner, um, right below the One Dozen Who Care logo is the Multicultural Women's Development Conference logo. It has, it represents all the races of people. I had a pen given to me years ago that showed a truly United States. So I adjusted that to make it a North Carolina United group. So you can see all the faces of the different races of people on that on that logo. And that is the Multicultural Women's Development Conference that has been held since the year 2000 over at Hinton Rural Life Center in Hayesville. Um, we missed two years. Last year, we could not have it because of the virus. And this year, we are working on a virtual uh, women's conference. So I hope a lot of people will join us. Right now, Janelle Ajiman is working as the head of the Pearl Miller African American Book Collection Reading Challenge. And we hope that a lot of children will join in and read a book because what we're offering from a gift from our president who lives in Texas now, Patricia Hall, we pay, we will pay the children $5 for every book they read, and that's K through 12. So 
uh, all the parents and everybody that's out there that's listening to this, encourage the children because the, the reading challenge will be over at the end of this month and that's only a few days. We might could extend it a little bit, but we really would hope that you would encourage your children to read about African Americans. It is a collection that is at the Andrews Library. And uh, now Murphy is opening up a cultural uh, uh, section in their library, and we're working with them as well for the future. One Dozen Who Care uh, has right now the uh, it's the One Dozen Who Care Prescott Scholars that you'll see up at the top uh, right. And the current one is Hannah Sullivan. The first one, very first one was Hannah Bailey. Under, the, under their pictures, you'll see our youth mentoring that we don't have right now, but we're working on it. We hope to start our new program for youth mentoring in the summer this year. You'll see those children at the Alex Haley Park. We took our youth to Tuskegee University, to Knoxville, to the Bessie Smith Museum, to the Alex Haley uh, Park, as you can see them there on the statue of Alex Haley. We wanted them to understand their history. And the white children that joined us joined right in and wanted to learn. And this is what my hope is, is that white people, adults, will begin to understand they need to know about all of the history, not just white history, which has been written up in the history books, but ours has been left out, the Latinx people, the, the Cherokee, the Asians, everybody in this country needs to know about each other. And then we'll, te we'll tear down these walls that divide us and we'll build bridges. So if you look over to the left a little bit, you'll see our Latino outreach. Two of those people right there are very dear friends to me right now. And they have children that act as, when they see me, they act as if I'm the dearest auntie to them. I'd love for them to call me auntie. <laughs> they are beautiful people, the two on the right and the other people, the four are the first graduates from our English as a second language class that we held. Then above that is the culture, culture fest that we held right down in Andrews. We also had technology training. Rhonda Bertha uh, taught people how to use the computers and people came all the way from Georgia and Haywood County to Andrews to learn how to use their computers. Uh, further on the bottom section is the, the elder dinner. Another project that we had to try to build bridges and pull people together was a multicultural group of adults, older people. And we always honored an older African-American person who was in the community doing a lot of work. So I thank you all for this and we can move to the next slide uh, if we have one. Yeah, so the greatest of these is love is a fantastic statement. And over here, Robert Louis Stevenson says, a, a friend is a gift that you give to yourself. So I wanna thank all of you for being with me today and I don't have a clock in front of me. So I hope that we'll be able to have some questions answered. Yeah, so actually, this is that was perfect timing, Ann. We we're right on the money for where we were supposed to be, and we do have a number of questions. Um, and so I'm going to start with one of the initial questions I had in the beginning, again, because we we're talking about actively aging and activism. Um, how old was um, your grandpa Miller when he established Habitat? He was just out of the service, so I would suspect that he was in his 20s. Okay, so he was, so he was a, one of those yeah. trailblazers. Yes, That's a beautiful it thing. Yeah. <laughs> so a great example of, you know, really starting off young um, with your passion and your, and your purpose. And so I believe that's probably, it was in your DNA, wasn't it? <laughs> it sure was. Grandpa always told me, and this is one thing that encouraged me in life. Grandpa said, Anne can do anything. Now I knew I couldn't, but I did some building that my dad and mom bought me a little um, carpenter set when I was really young. And I started making things. So uh, he, when he said that to me, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, right. Okay, so we have another question about um, your tenure as a, a school child. They were asking, um, were there any Cherokee students that you went to school with? 
No, our, our, I don't know. I think the Cherokee students went to the white school, we called it. Um, uh, at that time, there was the, the prejudice that was there kept us separated, but they also separated out the, the Cherokee students from us. Mm. And uh, there is in uh, one section, um, one of my slides in my presentations elsewhere shows the Black Indians that were there. We had uh, Black Indian people who lived in our community, but they had to live in the Black community, separated mm. from the white community. And um, so, so it was a unique situation. It, mm -hmm. I have no bitterness about it because let me tell you something. When I graduated from eighth grade, there was no way to go to the white school. It was totally segregated. Oh. But I went to Allen High School in Asheville. Mm -hmm. And for the first week, I cried a little bit because I was away from home living in a boarding school. But after that, I was like, what's wrong with me? <laughs> <laughs> you enjoyed this. <laughs> I'm having a good time here. And by being at, in, in, at Allen, I had a chance in the choir to travel all over Western North Carolina, east, even east of Asheville. And uh, also, we, were we traveled up into New York and Vermont and met people up there, white people who had never even seen a Black person in person. <laughs> so it was an amazing experience to go to Allen High School. And I'm so proud because they sent me, they made sure I went to college as well. That's wonderful. Yeah. Okay, so we have look, we have a plethora of questions. That means we're really enjoying oh. this webinar. Um, another <laughs> question was, on um, what is your primary medium um, for your art? Is it water, watercolor, acrylic? Um, because they comment that they are wonderfully rich in content and execution. Well, thank you. It's oils. I paint in oils, but I do drawings with uh, charcoal and lead also. Okay. And I do color pencil. <laughs> Mm, so multi multi art yes. mediums that's beautiful yes. okay and our next one is how do we get on the mailing list for updates on this year's multicultural development conference um for we have a website in development right now and hopefully it will be up shortly but you can go to one dozen who care.org um there will be information up there at this point of the old website that um doesn't have a lot of information but that the, the conference will be held in April. So it gives you a little bit of time and I hope the website will be up shortly. And you can also call me at 828-321-1000 at and I will pass on the information to you as we update the website. Okay, now here's one about your book. What was the greatest obstacle that you faced in writing your book? Oh, that was the saddest part. <laughs> People were, um, reluctant to tell me their, their stories. And so I had to find ways of pulling it out or take my dad with me because they would tell the story in front of my dad. But sometimes um, they felt, I don't know what they felt, but I, I assured them that I was not going to put anything negative about their families in the book, that it was all gonna be to bring out the stories of their lives. And so the that was the greatest obstacle because even though we had the funds from the Blue Ridge National Heritage Area, and we were so grateful for that, those funds ran out before I could get to everybody because mm. people resisted and I had to go back and see them again. But, but the Blue Ridge National, without the Blue Ridge National Heritage Area's funding, we never could have done this. Oh, we're, we're glad, we're very excited and thankful for their investment in that because yes. it's, it is a treasure indeed. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so we have another question. Um, has Asheville engaged with One Dozen Who Care? Um, we, we decided that we would do our work in far Western North Carolina because Asheville has a lot of programs and a lot of people working like Joanna Greer McEachin, who's working with Abipa trying to bring down the walls that have divided us and make some justice and help people. So we decided we'd go from Waynesville and Canton back to Murphy. Uh, any, we have done some programs in, in Asheville, but basically we work in far Western North Carolina. Okay, and so what kind of resources or support do elders in your community need the most in order to have more opportunities to pass on their knowledge creativity and stories to young people? Well, we did the elder dinner to honor 
the older people who were doing their work, trying to help the young people and trying to help you know everybody. Uh, so they've done a lot of volunteering and working all, all throughout the community. Right now, it's difficult to say because of the virus. We can't get out and about the way we want to, but we believe it's gonna be under control shortly. Well, I'll say shortly because we have had to go through a whole year and now these, these couple of months. So hopefully we will be able to start working with the older people again and get them to help the young people and the young people to teach the older people how to use their phones <laughs> and their computers <laughs> and all of that kind of thing. So they can help each other. Wonderful. And I know the answer to this one, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Are any of your paintings for sale? <laughs> <laughs> yes, anybody can go to uh, the site anstree.com and, and find my paintings there. And also, I'm working to try to get prints made of them. There is a place called Fine Art America on the web, but uh, I, I'm not quite sure exactly how to use it yet. So this old lady is trying to learn how to use technology too. So <laughs> great. I, I'll have that up shortly. <laughs> so ever learning. Okay, so ever this learning. is this is another wonderful question. It says, you've had so many influences in your life. Who was the biggest and why? Well, I can't say who, but, but I mean, one, uh, there were so many, but mom and daddy were there for us. Daddy was like his father who didn't believe that girls should go to the field to work. So we worked around the house. We, we were able to play and, and be loved and cared for in our family, within the family. My dad, I'll, I'll say this about my dad. He was one that would get up before the, the sun. I, it was just amazing, before sun up. And he worked till after sundown. He was hired by the school system for who knows how little <laughs> to build a fire in our school building. When we, we didn't stop going to school for snow. So when daddy would walk, he didn't have a vehicle at the time, when he would walk over to the school to build a fire on his way to work, he left footsteps. And I always remember going, stepping in his big footsteps to go to the school. Mm. And mama was a most loving person. She would sing to us, teach us how to sing, teach us how to read. My dad was injured in, in, when he was in third grade and he never really learned to read and write, but he was brilliant. Like I said, he could do almost anything, build a house from the ground up, handle so many different um, activities, job activities. And mama could read. And so she would read to us and tell us stories and, and things out of, the, out of the books that she would read to us when we were really small. So they are my best ones. But then my grandpa and then my little sister, Nina, I call her Nina B, was there for me from four years old, standing, watching me paint. And mom would say, Nina, come away. Don't bother her while she's painting. And I say, mama, she's not bothering me. And she'd just take a little breath and look and say, oh, how did you do that? <laughs> so I, family was my greatest influence. But my yeah. teacher, Ida Mae Logan, was next. And she really sent my artworks out there and made sure that I got blue ribbons and gold keys and all kinds of things like that at her own expense. Yeah, so it was really a collective of inspiration and influence. Yes, yes. Yeah. And okay. Into the high school. Mm -hmm. So the next question we have is, what, what are some of the biggest challenges faced by African-Americans living um, in rural Western North Carolina to thrive? And what role does racism play? You know, I... Sometimes people don't like to hear folks um, say that we do still have racism in this area. I was the, I guess I was maybe the first black person to live downtown. I bought a building downtown and moved into it. And my building was egged so many times it was just pitiful. But let me tell you, there are some of the most wonderful, wonderful folks here that are white people who really will support and do what they can to help the black community. So the main thing that we have as a challenge is that we, our people don't often participate. They won't go to the events that are, that are being held. Some, uh, I've only had a very few who have attended the events of One Dozen Who Care when they're big, when they're large events. So that's a big challenge for us is to get our people to move out into the community and work with the people there who are really willing to work with them. 
Okay, so I think the final question that I have that I see in the Q&A anyway is a very befitting one to end with. How can people purchase your book? Uh -huh. <laughs> well, number one, they can go to my website again, and then they can go to Amazon and uh, it's in bookstores, uh, City Lights bookstores, bookstore in, in uh, Silva has just purchased uh, a number of the books so that they can have them on hand. We have the Curiosity Bookshop in Murphy and the museum in Murphy that has the books, Books Unlimited, Blue Ridge Books. So they're scattered around all over far Western North Carolina. And to say this um, so that people understand, uh, one dozen who care uh, originally published this book, but because I was the one that was going all over the place speaking and doing everything uh, for the book, we worked together and I bought I bought the product from them. So now I'm the publisher of the book, just to make sure everybody understands. Look, that's even better. We love that, <laughs> that it's published and it's, um, everything's going straight to you. Yes, but And you. we just know that we have really uh, enjoyed the time with you. And I, we know that this is the beginning to many more interactions across the region and across the world, this resurgence of, <laughs> or the renaissance of Anne, as oh. I really enjoy her. And we hope that you have been inspired as well. And again, to actively age and real, you are the epitome of that and <laughs> activism, um, using your, your powers for good. And anyone else is on the line, we charge you to do the same. And so now I'm gonna turn it back over to Rebecca. Thank you all again for coming. Thank you. Rebecca, you're muted. You're muted, Rebecca. <laughs> Good thing for friends. Can you hear me okay now? Okay. I hope you all recognize the treasure that I mentioned in the beginning of the program today. Um, Anne is truly a treasure and an inspiration. Um, and we want to inspire you to continue with us because the next step is going to be a book club. For those of you interested in reading Anne's book or getting a copy at the library, um, we are initiating a book club to start in two weeks. And you'll see the registration for that in the chat. And Anne here is gonna grace us with her presence at the book club. So it will be an opportunity to discuss and dive deeper into some of these topics and the way, it the way history is informing us every day and what we can do moving forward to foster more racial justice in our community, to own our privilege and to work together with greater peace. So we hope you will join our book club. Um, this is the first of a series of book clubs. Um, so uh, after this event, you will receive an email from AARP that says, would you like to opt in to emails? Now, I know we all get lots of emails, but I also want to let you know that if you do opt in, you can learn more about events like this because we don't email people who we don't have permission to. So you may choose to opt in if you'd like to stay informed about future events. Um, finally, our AARP's social mission, which is to empower people to choose how they age, great example, um, is fueled by volunteers. It's fueled by community members who really inspire events like this and show up in our community every day. And if you want to be a part of our volunteer team, um, I will have my email address in the chat in a moment, and we'd love to hear from you. Also, AARP has a website, um, a local website with local stories and also upcoming events. So we would love to have you tune in on that. I see Sherry already put that link into the chat. So this isn't um, a story about us, but we did need to get in there for just a second to let you know how we can stay in touch. Um, one final question for you, Anne. Who is the girl in the painting above your desk? Oh, that's my precious little friend, Melody. She was uh, my dear friend, Evie Bush, who used to have a hair salon here. She's Puerto Rican, and that's her child. And I feel like she's my little baby, too and her brother who stops by all the time to visit me when he's in town. So this is wonderful. Those children all were precious to me. And so I keep her close to me. I actually sold that painting once and because uh, I had to have some money. And the lady said, when you get ready to kick the bucket, you give back your treasures. I was like, what? You're not going to kick the bucket. <laughs> but I have it now. And it'd be difficult for me to turn it loose. <laughs> Yeah.
you muted again, Rebecca. <laughs> well, you didn't hear any dogs barking, at least, or babies crying. <laughs> that was a perfect story to cap off our event. If you didn't get your questions answered, you can send me an email. I put my email in the chat, and we'll make sure that your questions are forwarded on to Anne, and we hope you will join us for the book club. So any final words, my friends? Thank Anna you. Joanna? Thank okay. you very much. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> we'll see you later. Bye. Bye. <laughs>